All right, we are coming down to the wire. We have five more classes, including today. Um, we have, if, if my counting is right, is my counting right? Because we have Thanksgiving off. Because we have Thanksgiving off, right? So we have today and, and, and Thursday. Then we have Tuesday of next week, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have the Tuesday and Thursday of the following week. So one thing that is intended to, uh, one, one thing that I intend is that in your project, you will dot the I's and cross the T's for some of the things that we don't cover completely in here. All right? And that's done deliberately. All right, believe it or not. Um, for example, all right, um, grid views. Updating a grid view and doing the stuff to update a grid view, template columns, all that stuff is identical on a grid view and a details view. So I'm not going to go over doing that on a grid view. I mean, I might at some point go over a quick example if I'm talking about something else, but... It's not like I'm going to focus on that because literally if you can do one, you should be able to do the other or, and figure out any differences uh, to that. The only difference between a grid view and a details view is that you cannot insert on a grid view or you can insert in a details view, although we haven't talked about that yet. So again, I'm, that, that's a detail that I'm leaving out and, and hoping for you to be able to pick up. Another detail that, that um, you have enough information to do this, or pretty much enough information to do this, would be to custom write, where you did not use the built-in uh, functions, but you wrote the code yourself to do the insert, similar to what we did with the query. Sometimes that comes in handy to be able to do that. And I may go over an example of that, I may not, but don't think always in terms of details view and grid view. Sometimes it's more worthwhile for you to um, code it yourself. Let me give you a, a for example. For example, if you had something where someone logged on all right, to an application and then was going to post a comment, all right, and the comment was going to have the current date associated with it, Two of those three things are not entered in by the user on the comment form, right? If you think of like going to a YouTube comment, um, it shows the date and it shows the person that made it. Two of the, uh, and it shows a comment. The only thing that you key in is a comment. The other two things come from other places, right? The time comes from the system time that, you, that, that it was made. And the date, or uh, the time and date comes from that. And the um, who you are comes from probably a session variable indicating that you, it is you who have logged on. Well, just like we did a login where we programmatically created a select statement to go out and do a query, you could do um, updates and inserts and other stuff like that uh, without using a detailed view or grid view. You could just create your own text boxes and enter a comment in that way. All right. So, again, some of these things, as we get down to the wire, I may or may not uh, have examples for. Um, but that's part of the, your job in the project is to figure these things out. But keep in mind that you're not figuring it out on your own. All right. Um, I'm available to give you assistance in, in figuring any of this stuff out. So, you know, I like when students take initiative. And, and try stuff on their own and try to go beyond what we've gone in class. That being said, this is also a class. And I recognize that, you know, you may intend to do it all by yourself, but you might run into some uh, stumbling blocks. Well, if that happens, you know, you, you have help available. So don't be so committed to doing it all yourself um, and say, well, he said to work on this on my own, that means he's not going to help me. That's not the case at all. All right. So take a shot with some of these things, but if there's something that you don't know how to do, maybe take a few minutes to take a, a shot at it, do some investigating and so on. But if you run into problems, don't sit there um, spinning your wheels and not making any progress. You know, go, go and ask for help.
That's what I did this week and tried to implement an RSS feed. Okay. Or right. I managed to get the feed right, but I can't render it in HTML without a PHP, which I don't plan on using. No, that is simply not true. Huh? You do not need PHP to render an RSS feed. I don't know how to render it in an iframe. I mean, render it like, render the top three news items from it. Okay. I mean, it's a programming task, right? Yeah. And ASP.NET plus C Sharp is a framework plus a programming language. I've been looking, I've been looking through it. Okay. I'm just saying, the, I'm not disagreeing with the fact that, that or, or I'm not giving you grief because you're having a hard time with it. I am um, questioning your statement that you need PHP. It may be clear to you how to do it in PHP, or you may have found an example that works in PHP, but it, you can do it in ASP.NET C Sharp as well. I mean, guaranteed. All right. We left off last time and we talked about doing edits to um, a site, or not to a site, to a, um, to a row in the database. And we talked about the use of the template column as one way of deviating from the default. Again, the default is very bare bone for how you make how, how you edit a details view or grid view. And that is labels if you're in read only mode, text boxes if you're not. All right? Now, we saw where that kind of thing doesn't work, right? Um, for example, when we want to choose from a drop-down. Um, also doesn't work if you have validation. So when you want to deviate from the default behavior, you can use the template columns. So let's bring up the example from last time, take a quick quick look at it, and move on from there. I'll have it down only to forget the entire thing over winter break. two columns into template columns. 
we converted the first name and the last name into, uh, I'm sorry, the first name and the skill level to template columns. We converted the first name because we wanted to add a validation to it. So it will say if they don't enter anything in. We create, uh, we create a template column for the skill level because we wanted the skill level to be a drop down. All right. Now, keep in mind, and when we look at this, I want to point out a couple of things about the SQL here. First of all, notice that we're selecting everything from there. All right? And our update statement includes everything that is not read only. All right? And I think we found in lab that it needs to be in the same sequence. All right? Um, that makes it easier, too. So make uh, the update statement have the columns in the same sequence as the select statement. And make sure there's the same number of them. If there's a column you did not want to have to, ch you did not want to change, then make it read only. All right? And then it won't put it in. So, for example, notice that the player ID is not included uh, as part of the update part of the update statement. It's used in the where clause, but it's not used in the update portion because we don't want a, the, the person to be able to, use, to uh, update the player ID. So, we go to run this. And... If I log on, I should be directed to that page and be in edit mode. Now, our form design is such that we prevent certain errors from happening. So, for example, first name's a required field, so we catch that by a validator. One thing that I've noticed in, in class here is that people seem, maybe I did not stress the validators enough this semester, all right? Because a lot of people look to writing their own code to do the validations, like putting if statements in the C sharp. And it's great that you know that and, and, and all, but by putting it in a validator, you get a lot of wins. Namely, it's code that executes both on the client side and on the server side. All right? And therefore, you um, don't have to worry about if someone doesn't support JavaScript. All right? It, that, that's a win. Because if they do support JavaScript, then they get an immediate answer to their question of whether the form is valid or not. All right, They don't have to send it to the server to find out if it's valid or not. It, it tells them immediately. Now, if you do write code on the server side, for example, in the login, the one thing that you could do is put uh, a validator on the password and user ID and then test is valid. I realize that sounds very confusing. I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. All right. So here we can choose the skill level. And notice a couple things. First of all, it stays on this page. It would make sense to me that after you've updated your personal information, you go somewhere else. You no longer need to be on this page. All right. And we can only pick from the list of things. If we go to update, it gives us an error message and so on. Now, let's go and look at the login page for a second. Login page right now doesn't have any validation in it. So, you go and run this and go to log on and, oh, you get an ugly error. All right? Why? Because there's no values for those things and therefore you're trying to
to do a lookup where there's nothing to be found. So how can we fix that? We could fix that by putting in validators for both the user ID and password. So, I'll just do it for user ID, but you do it the same way for the password. So I'll pull a required field validator over. There. With the required field, uh, field validator, you can set to say what do you want the error message to say. User ID missing. You can say whether the display is static or dynamic. Static means it takes up the space even when the message isn't displaying. Control to validate is what do you want to validate. And in this case, we want to validate the user ID. Now, you do the exact same thing to text box if you wanted to do that. I think that's about it. Now, remember, there's a whole bunch of validators. <clears throat> and again, I believe there's a, a section in the book that talks about this. But a compare validator will validate to make sure two things are equal or one thing is greater than the other thing. So, for example, if I said, if I was doing a search for an age range, and I wanted to, in my little league here, pick up everyone between the ages of 12 and 14, all right, it would make sure that the first number was less than the second number, because it wouldn't make any sense to say, give me everything between 14 through 12, right? I mean, that doesn't make sense. So, the compare validator would make sure that when you compare two items, item A is less than item B, all right? Or like if you're entering in a date range, the first date should be earlier than the second date. Compare validator is also val uh, uh, valuable if you're like comparing a, a password with a confirm password, right? You know, you, you make them enter the password twice so that it, uh, you make sure that they get it right. Well, you could put a validator on to make sure that those two are equal. Um, you can also use a compare validator to compare it against a certain type. So, for example, you can say, I want to compare this and make sure it's a date type. All right. Custom validator is sort of a none of the above. I'm going to write my own JavaScript, but I'm going to hook it into the .NET um, framework. A range validator validates between things that are, are within a certain range. So, if you had a place to enter a year in, let's say it was someone's birth year, You'd figure out the oldest person on earth and put that as the first year, and then you'd put the current year as the last year. All right. Regular expression validator is used to make sure things fit a certain format. In other words, a phone number is a certain format, right? There's three digits for an area code, there's three digits for an exchange, and then there's four digits that's the number. All right. And international phone numbers have some extra numbers in, all right? An email address fits a certain format. You have something, an at sign, then something, dot something. All right? So the regular expression validator um, makes sure that whatever you e uh, key in fits a certain format. And you can customize that one as well. For example, if you worked at a company that had a part number that fit a certain po uh, format, like maybe the part number is two letters followed by four numbers. All right. You could validate for that by writing your own regular expression. All right. Regular expressions aren't a .NET thing. They are in a lot of different, I mean, they're, they're just a thing onto themselves. Finally, you have a validation summary. It's a way for you to group all the email, uh, all the emails, all the validations that you do, whether it be for email or whatever. Now, I put my validation control here, and if this is run, and JavaScript is enabled, it'll immediately do the validation. So if I forget the user ID, it tells me that. Didn't go to the server, notice. All right, it gave me that result immediately. Now, if I did have JavaScript disabled, then it would go and try to run the server-side code for the button click event. That's where I can stick in a single line of code to say if, 
is valid. And what does that do? Well, this is just sort of a catch in case they do not have JavaScript enabled. If they have JavaScript enabled, it will never make it to this point and be invalid, right? Because the validator controls would have made sure that it didn't make it to this point. But if it makes it to this point and it's invalid, it means that JavaScript is not enabled and you simply want to go in and check to make sure it's valid before you do anything. So this line, this if statement, should probably wrap any of your code on your but on any button click event, all right, if is valid. And only do the stuff that you want to do if the form is valid. So Does, doesn't hurt even if you don't have any validation controls, because you might add some later. Yes? You just answered. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. So, we talked about there being a kind of error in SQL that we cannot possibly prevent through our form. All right? Remember, we've prevented a couple errors from happening, and I use, use the word prevent with a grain of salt, all right? Because, you know, we could probably concoct some crazy scenario that we'd have a problem with, but we've eliminated the error if they forget their first name. We've eliminated the error of them not having a valid skill level, right? Because we only show them the valid skill levels. There are a certain kind of errors, though, that we can't check for and we can't prohibit by the design of our form. For example, if I try to enter someone with the same user ID, right? Now, I'm not talking about their player ID, which is generated. I'm talking about the user ID, which the user keys in. That's what they use to log in. That's a um, candidate key, right? Because it also has to be unique, because I can't have two people with the same user ID trying to log in. Now, there's nothing I can do easily in the form to prevent that, other than not letting them change their user ID, which I guess I could do that, but that doesn't seem to be, um, that, that's not what we're talking about today. I can't put a drop down there because, again, a drop down allows you to select between options. And what are the options for your user ID? Well, there's unlimited number of options. I couldn't do a validation because that requires some database interactivity. And client side validation isn't of that type. What I can do, though, is I can let the database operation fail and then handle the error gracefully. And let me show you about the problem that I'm talking about. If I go in here and I log in successfully, if I try to change my password or user ID to DH, all right, there's already a DH in the database. It should not let me do that because I believe there's a duplicate um, or, or there's a uh, unique, uh, unique index on it to prevent that. But how could I write validation to do that client side? I can't access the database. I can't use a drop down or anything that else. So when I click update, what happens? It explodes. All right. So there are some errors that you simply can't, or I hesitate to use the word can't, are impractical to address. You just essentially have to let them happen and handle them in a user-friendly way. All right. Now, some of you that have done coding in C Sharp or other languages know of a try-catch block. How many of you have heard of or used a try-catch block? All right. Everyone or just about everyone. We had to, I think we had to do that to get 
to the prereqs for this class. Okay. Uh, again, I I can't remember these things off the top of my head. Uh, what's a prereq for what, and what's covered in what? So good. Um, essentially, what happened is an exception was thrown. All right, but we're going to handle it in a little bit different way. Let's think about it for a second. Normally, you put a try catch around your code where there's the potential for a problem. Well, let's look in the player info. Where do we put our code? There's no instructions here to put a try catch block around, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the only lines of code we have are here, and that has nothing to do with doing an update. All right? So, and if they're not here, where do they exist? Well, they exist in the framework, right? In other words, notice this line here. This player info page inherits from system.web.ui.page. So in object-oriented terms, this is a subclass of that which means that a lot of the functionality of how the page works is built into the framework classes. All right? And the good news is we don't have to worry about that then. It is handled for us. The bad news is is that we don't if we want to customize the way it behaves, we have to do a little work. All right? Now, what we can do is harder to do in the new version. Go into the details view and
events. And these are events that you can write code to. All right. Now notice especially that there is for insert, delete, and update, there's two versions of the events. I won't say two versions of the events. There's two different events that, that look related. One is written in the present tense and one is written in the past tense. So we have on item deleting and we have on item deleted. All right. Likewise, we have on item inserted and on item inserting. All right. On item updated, on item updating. Updating means it's in the process of being updated. So updating actually is the event that fires off before the actual update occurs. Updated is the code that fires off after the update has been made. So we want to try to do the update, and if it fails, display an error message. So we want the item updated event. All right. The item updated event is where we are going to place our code. Why? Because we're going to tr let it try to do the update. All right. If it failed, then we want to display an error message. We don't want to display the big, ugly system message that we had before. And if the update did work, we want to probably send the user somewhere else. So I'm going to pick on item updated equals, then I get create new event. And I can click that, and it created a new event in the code behind. So if I look in the code behind, I'll see that I now have details, view one, item updated. So this is the code that gets executed after the update occurs. So this is where we put our stuff in. Keep in mind the mentality at work here. A lot of this functionality of updating the details view and all that are handled by the classes in the framework. But they know that we may need to customize that code sometimes. Well, they can't give us a framework code to customize. All right, That could get to be a mess. So what they've done is they've given us, hook. they've given us hooks that we can put our code in that surround the events that happen in the framework. So, in this case, we have the item updated event where we can put code after the update has occurred and we can put code to see whether there's been an error or not. Okay? So, how do we tell if there's been an error or not? Well, details view updated event args are sort of the framework's report about what happened. Did it work or not? All right. And one of the attributes of that of that object E, one of it is the affected rows. So we can tell how many rows got updated. All right, we can see if there were zero, if there were one, or however many. We can see the new values. In other words, what the fields were updated to. We can see the old values, what the old values used to be and so on down the line. The one we are interested in is the exception. All right. We are interested in the exception because 
Remember we talked about a minute ago, there was no code for us to put a try or catch around because all the code that was relevant was in the framework. This exception, though, is to report back if there were any exceptions thrown. All right. So. to test to see if that exception is equal to null or not. <coughs> what does it mean if the exception is not equal to null? It means, go ahead. It's got something in it. It has something in it. What does it mean if the exception has something in it? Something went wrong. Something went wrong. All right. So this scenario right here where the exception is not equals null means that something is wrong. And, of course, If the exception is null, if it's not not null, all right, <laughs> then it went okay. All right. So, we've gone into this predefined event. This event is predefined. The contents of the event is not predefined. That's where we write. Think of this as a hook. This is a framework giving you a place to put your code where you can test what happened after an update was attempted. So this event fires off whether you code anything or not. So we're simply going to check here, and we're going to check to see if there's a problem or not. So if there's a problem, then we want to display some sort of error message. Right? So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to create on my web page a label and I'm going to initialize it to nothing and I'm going to change the name of the label to label db error so if something went wrong I'm going to say Label dbr dot text equals no update made. I have to do one more thing. I have to tell the framework, I got that one, all right? Don't worry about that problem. I handle that. And you do that by setting that exception handled attribute to true. That effectively tells the framework, you don't have to worry about this one anymore. I did what I needed to do with it, all right? And what I need to do, well, I displayed a message saying that no update was made. Is that the most descriptive message? No, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, if it went okay, what do we want to do? I don't know. Let's send the user to the news page. All right. It seems like a seems like a reasonable thing to do. Response redirect. News.aspx. So if you remember before, 
After it successfully updated, it stayed at that same page. It didn't go anywhere else. Here we're just going to send them somewhere else. Okay. So now let's try this. So I go here and I log in as me. Well, it's calling a method on the response object. The response object um, controls the, what the server is telling the client what to do. And we're telling it to redirect, that is, go to this page. So I log in. And I go and I try to change it to DH. All right. Now I'm going to get an error. So it should run my error code and display a message. And there we go. Label, no update made. I don't know why it says label here. I was wondering that too. I was like, what's the same label? Yeah, I, 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 I think I actually put two labels on there when I, um, when I intended to put one. So now I go and I change it to MZ. This should work because there are no other MZs. And I click update and there it goes. It sends me to the news page. All right. So let's look at this in more detail. <coughs> yeah, there's... Let's look at this in more detail. This happens after the update was attempted. All right, that's what item updated means. If you ever wanted to do some code before it updated, you could do it in the item updating event. And that would happen as it was being updated. So in other words, slightly before the database operation occurred. After it's updated, we look to see if this E object, and what is the E object? Well, the E object is details view updated event arguments. It's the report of the framework back to your code saying what happened. All right? Yes? It called itself E, right? We didn't actually like the name. It called itself E, right. In other words, these methods are in the framework. And it's going to call it, and it's going to pass that. All right. What we're doing here is we're taking and we're writing code for that event. So we don't get to make up the arguments here. So we can never change where the E is. The framework's like this is E. Yes. This is e. Okay. Exactly. Strictly speaking, we could probably change the name of it, but we couldn't change the type of it. All right. So one of the attributes of E is whether there's an exception or not. And if that exception is not null, that means there was an exception. That is, there was a problem. So I can display a message. And then the last thing I have to do is I have to tell it that the exception was handled. Right? Because otherwise, the framework doesn't know that it was handled, and therefore it will handle it itself. And we saw at the beginning of class how the, ex how the framework handles the exceptions. Right? The framework just displays a big old ugly error message. All right. It went okay, then we want to redirect to that. Now, this is our message. I can actually display if I want to. The actual text of the ex uh, of the uh, exception. If I go and run this,
pretty intimidating for a user to see, right? However, when you're developing your application, you might want to see error messages that look like this. So you could simply, you could have this error message in your code and then change it um, after you've debugged this page successfully. So this might be a good approach to display the actual exception because that tells me in very precise details of exactly what went wrong. All right. Or I could run it through debugger would be the other way and look at that variable. Once I've figured out and I've debugged this and I know that it's correct, what I can do though is I can replace that with a more meaningful error message. So there's all kinds of attributes of the exception object that I could display there that could help me in debugging. All right. But when I go in production, I probably want to um, probably want to um, make it a more user-friendly error message. Now, with every database operation we attempt, specifically if we think of updates, inserts, and deletes, we can anticipate what can go wrong. Right? We should be able to anticipate what can go wrong. Now, I'm not thinking of syntax errors, where you simply have a column name wrong or something like that. That's going to show up a different sort of way. All right? What I'm talking about is where your code is correct, but the database operation fails anyhow. What are examples of that? Well, examples of that, one of them that we just saw is if you violated the constraints of the database. User ID is a unique index. Therefore, it must be unique. If it's not unique, then there's a problem. All right? Now, we can't code to test for that in advance, so we let that error occur, and then we grab and display it. So that's one case here. What are other constraints? Well, we could have left the first name blank. So that's a possibility, except we put in validation for that. Right? So we are pretty sure that that's not the problem here. All right? Because we can keep that sort of error from happening simply by putting validation in. There's sort of a catch-all, right? That the database could have crashed. The database server crashed. And between the time that we pull up the data and the time we do the update. Again, as a small time frame, is it likely? No, but it's possible. So when you phrase your error message, you, could phrase, you should phrase it in such a way, in my opinion, to list the most likely causes, but don't say that that's definitely the problem. So how would I word the error message here? I'd probably say something like, Update failed. Likely cause. And what's the, what's the only error that we can't test through validation or anything like that? A duplicate user ID. So likely cause duplicate user ID. Try again with a different user ID or something like that. Try again. Yes? So I think this would cause like the same thing, but if we put constraints in the database, like you can only have 10 characters long and they try to enter in like an 11 character thing, would this same error probably happen? It would, but that we could put validation to prevent. Okay. Remember, this is. This is sort of the catch-all for stuff that we can't validate for. All right? So if we can validate for it easily, we should validate for it. And then we don't have to worry about it hitting this. But if we can't validate it, but yes, you're right. Any sort of database constraint, foreign key constraints. So like in this case, uh, the skill level. 
all right, um, null fields, um, any of those sorts of things, unique indexes. Um, now, we could write code that before the update happened, ran out to see if there was someone with that user ID. We could write code to do that, all right? First of all, what event would we put that in? The code that happened before the update and check to see if there was someone with the user ID. That would be updating, right? Because updating happens before. All right. Why didn't I take that approach? I didn't take that approach because A, I'm thinking most of the time this is going to, uh, most of the time, how do I want to put this? Rather than every single time checking to see if there's a duplicate, I'm just going to let it assume that it's okay and then catch the error afterwards. All right? In other words, I'm not going to make it work every single time when only a handful of times there's going to be a duplicate. Plus the code's more involved to do that and so on. So it's perfectly acceptable to say that I'm going to let it try to do that operation and fail and then report the error in a user-friendly way as opposed to writing code that looks in advance. But you're right. If we were going to do that validation, we would do it in the details view one item updating event. All right. Questions over this. Another reason why I would do it in the updated event is I'm going to need this anyhow for all the unforeseen errors that I couldn't possibly foresee, right? That's why they're unforeseen errors, right? That is the database crashing and so on. So I'm probably going to have code like this anyhow. So I might as well handle it there. All right, let's see. It's quarter after. At the very least, and again, you know, we could talk about topics forever, right, in this class. And fortunately for you, it's not forever. It's just for the next four classes after today. Let me tell you what I at least want to handle. I at least want to handle inserts and deletes. Now, each one of these should be easier than the previous one, right? Because most of the things we talk about for inserts and deletes, we've already talked about for updates. So guess what? There's a details view item deleting and deleted, all right, uh, method that we can go and see if it failed to delete and we can catch it and, and display an error message. Likewise, item inserting, item inserted event. So all this applies. There'll be SQL. There are modes. There are templates. So most of the stuff that we do for deletion and inserting is going to be virtually the same for what we're doing here. All right. Um, I think I'm going to just end for today. I don't feel like talking about starting talking about deletion, which we'll do next because deleting is like real, real, real easy. All right. Um, and we'll pick up on that on Thursday and then get into inserting.